It's story time with LED. Tonight's story is Jack the Giant Killer. In the reign of the famous King Arthur, there lived in Cornwall a lad named Jack, who was a boy of bold temper and took delight in hearing or reading of conjurers, giants, and fairies. He used to listen eagerly to the deeds of the knights of King Arthur's round table. In those days, there lived on St. Michael's Mount, off Cornwall, a huge giant, 18 feet high and 9 feet round. His fierce and savage looks were the terror of all who beheld him. His name was Cormoran, and he dwelled in a gloomy cavern on the top of the mountain and used to wade over to the mainland in search of prey. He would throw half a dozen oxen upon his back, tie three times as many sheep and hogs around his waist, and march back to his own abode. The giant had been doing this for many years when Jack resolved to destroy him. Jack took a horn, a shovel, a pickaxe, his armor, and a dark lantern, and one winter's evening he went to the mount. There he dug a pit twenty-two feet deep and twenty broad. He covered the top over to make it look like solid ground, and then blew such a loud and long tantara that the giant awoke and came out of his den roaring, You saucy villain! You shall pay for this! I shall broil you for my breakfast! He had scarcely spoken when, taking one step farther, he tumbled into the pit, and Jack struck him such a blow on the head with his pickaxe that he killed him. Jack then returned home to cheer his friends with the news. When the townsfolk heard of this valiant action, they declared that henceforth he shall be called Jack the Giant Killer, and gave him a sword and belt, upon which was written in letters of gold, This is the valiant Cornishman who slew the giant Cormoran. Another giant, called Blunderbore, vowed revenge if he should have Jack in his power. This giant kept an enchanted castle, which stood in the midst of a lonely wood. One day, some time after the death of Cormoran, Jack was passing through this wood while on his way to Wales, and being weary, sat down and went to sleep. The giant, walking by and seeing the words on Jack's belt, carried him off to his castle, where he locked him up in a large room, the floor of it which was covered with the bones of men and women. Soon after, he went to fetch his brother, likewise a giant, to make a meal of Jack. Through the bars of his prison, Jack, terrified, could see the two giants approaching. Perceiving in one corner of the room a strong cord, Jack took courage, and making a slipknot at each end, threw it over the giant's heads and tied it to the window bars. He then pulled it with all his might till he had choked them. Quickly, he slid down the rope and stabbed them to the heart. Jack next took a bunch of keys from the pocket of Blunderbore and went into the castle again. He made a thorough search through all the rooms, and one of them found three ladies tied up by the hair on their heads and almost starved to death. They told him their husbands had been killed by the giants, who then condemned them to be starved to death because they would not eat the flesh of their dead husbands. "'Ladies,' said Jack, "'I have put an end to the monster and his wicked brother. "'I give you this castle and all the riches it contains "'to make some amends for the dreadful pain you have felt.' "'He then very politely gave them the keys of the castle "'and went farther on his journey. "'As Jack had but little money, "'he went on as fast as possible. "'At length he came to a handsome house, "'knocked at the door, "'and there came forth a Welsh giant.' Jack said he was a traveler who had lost his way, at which the giant made him welcome, and led him into a room where there was a good bed. Jack took off his clothes quickly, but though he was weary, he could not sleep. Soon after this, he heard the giant walking back and forth in the next room, saying, Though here you lodge with me this night, you shall not see the morning light. 
My club shall dash your brains out quite. Well, thought Jack, so these are the tricks you play upon travelers. Hmm. But I hope to prove as cunning as you. Then getting out of bed, he groped about the room and at last found a large wooden log. He laid it in his own place in the bed and then hid himself in a dark corner of the room. About midnight, the giant entered the room and with his bludgeon struck many blows on the bed in the very place where Jack had laid the log. Then he went back to his own room, thinking he had broken all Jack's bones. Early in the morning, Jack boldly walked into the giant's room to thank him for his lodging. The giant started when he saw him and began to stammer. Uh, uh, oh dear me, is it you? Pray, how did you sleep? Did you hear or see anything in the dead of night? Nothing worth speaking of, said Jack carelessly. A rat, I believe, gave me three or four slaps with its tail and disturbed me a little, but I soon went back to sleep again. The giant wondered more and more at this, yet he did not answer a word, but went to bring two great bowls of hasty pudding for their breakfast. Jack wanted to make the giant believe he could eat as much as himself, so he contrived to button a leather bag inside his coat and slipped the pudding into his bag while pretending to put it all into his mouth. While breakfast was over, he said to the giant, Now I will show you a fine trick. I can cure all wounds with a touch. I could cut off my head in one minute, and the next put it on sound again on my shoulders. You shall see. He then took hold of a knife, with one stroke, ripped up the leather bag, and all the pudding tumbled out upon the floor. I can do that myself, said the Welsh giant, who was ashamed to be surpassed by such a little fellow as Jack. So he snatched up the knife, plunged it into his own stomach, and in a moment dropped down dead on the floor. Having thus far been successful in all his undertakings, Jack resolved not to be idle in the future. He therefore furnished himself with a horse, a cap of knowledge, a sword of sharpness, shoes of swiftness, and an invisible coat, the better to perform the wonderful enterprises that lay before him. He traveled over high hills, and on the third day he came to a large and spacious forest through which the low road lay. Scarcely had he entered the forest when he beheld a monstrous giant dragging along a handsome knight and his lady by the hair of their heads. And there's the picture of the dreadful giant. Isn't that very nice? Jack alighted from his horse and, after trying, tying him to an oak tree, put on his invisible coat under which he carried his sword of sharpness. When he came up to the giant, he made several slashes at him, but he could not reach his body, but wounded his thighs in several places. At length, putting both hands to his sword and aiming with all his might, Jack cut off both the giant's legs. Then setting his foot upon his neck, he plunged the sword into the giant's body, and the monster gave a groan and expired. The knight and his lady invited Jack to their house to receive a proper reward for his services. No, said Jack, I cannot be easy till I find out this monster's habitation. So he mounted his horse, and soon after came in sight of yet another giant, who was sitting on a block of timber. Jack alighted from his horse, and putting on his invisible coat, approached and aimed a blow at the giant's head. But he only cut off his nose. On this, the giant seized his club and thrashed about unmercifully. Nay, said Jack, if this be the case, I'd better dispatch you. So jumping upon the block, he stabbed him in the back, and the giant dropped down dead. Jack then proceeded on his journey and traveled over hills and dales, arriving at the foot of a high mountain. He knocked at the door of a lonely house, where an old man let him in. When Jack was seated, the hermit addressed him thus, 
My son, on the top of this mountain is an enchanted castle kept by the giant Galagantus and a vile magician. I lament the fate of a duke's daughter, whom they seized as she was walking in her father's garden, and brought her here after transforming her into a deer. Jack promised that in the morning, at the risk of his own life, he would break the enchantment. When he had climbed to the top of the mountain, he saw two fiery griffins, but he passed between them without the least fear, for they could not see him in his invisible coat. On the castle gate, he found a golden trumpet, under which were written these lines. Whoever can this trumpet blow shall cause the giant's overthrow. As soon as Jack had read this, he seized the trumpet and blew a shrill blast, which made the gate fly open and the very castle itself tremble. The giant and the conjurer now knew their wicked course was at an end and they stood biting their nails and shaking with fear. With his sword of sharpness, Jack soon killed the giant, and the magician was then carried away by a whirlwind. Every night, a beautiful lady who had been changed into a bird or a beast returned to the proper shape. The castle vanished away like smoke, and the head of the giant, Galanticus, was sent to King Arthur. The knights and ladies rested that night at the old man's hermitage, and the next day they set out for the court. Jack went up to the king and gave his majesty an account of all his fierce battles. Jack's fame had now spread through the whole country, and at the king's desire the duke gave Jack his daughter in marriage to the joy of the entire kingdom. After this the king gave him a large estate on which he and his lady lived the rest of their days in joy and contentment.